Let me begin by thanking all of you for being, everybody should sit down, if that's okay. okay. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, being here this afternoon, and I want to thank President John Yellowbird Steele and President Steele's staff and uh, Larney Littlehoop and Miss Uglala Lakota Nation Santana Young Man Afraid of His Horses, Junior Miss Oglala Lakota Nation Courtney Littlehoop, uh, Tate Wee, CJ Clifford, Evie Espinosa, and Melone Hill. Uh, thank you all. The uh, reason we're here today is to try to understand what is going on in Pine Ridge and in other reservations. I know, and you know, there are a lot of problems here. Poverty is much too high. Is that right? There are not enough decent jobs in the area. Is that correct? The health care system is inadequate. And we need to fundamentally change the relationship between the U.S. government and the Native American community. So today I am here not to give you a speech, but I'm here to listen. But I do want to say the following. In America today, we have a massive level of income and wealth inequality. You all understand what I mean by that? We are living in a country where some people have unbelievable wealth, but a lot of other people are living in very dire poverty. In America today, we have communities where real unemployment is 30, 40, 50 percent even higher. And that is why we need a federal jobs program to put millions of people back to work. In America today, many people are working for wages which are much too low, which is why we have to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, $15 an hour. In America, we are the only major country on earth which does not guarantee health care to all people as a right. And that means we have got to see more doctors getting out to rural areas, including Indian reservations. We have got to substantially lower the cost of prescription drugs. And we have to be much more effective in dealing with problems like alcoholism and drug abuse. In my state of Vermont and up in New England, we have a serious crisis with opiate and heroin addiction, and that problem exists all across this country. And we have got to significantly improve mental health treatment so that people get the health care when they need it. And to the young people who are here, I want to say this. In my view, we should be making public colleges and universities tuition free. Now, the reason for that is that in many parts of this country, in order to get out and get a good job, you need a college education. But there are a lot of families in this country, and I grew up in a family that did not have a lot of money. 
There are a lot of families in this country who today simply cannot afford the high cost of college. So what I want to tell the young people here is I believe that if any young kid, whether it's in South Dakota or in Vermont or any place else, studies hard and does well in school, regardless of the income of that family, that child should be able to get into college. Now, as many of you know, our infrastructure, that is our roads, and I gather you have serious problems here with the quality of your roads, right? All right. And our bridges and our water systems all over America, people are worried about the quality of the water that they are drinking. And we've got to make sure that when you drink water, it is clean water, it is pure water. We have to improve our wastewater plants. We have to improve our rail system and our airports. And that's why I believe we should invest a trillion dollars in rebuilding our infrastructure and also in building affordable housing. And when we rebuild our infrastructure, we can create up to 13 million decent paying jobs, which is what we need to do. All right, our goal is to develop a new relationship with the Native American people. As I have said all over this country, the United States has learned an enormous amount and owes the Native American people a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. And one of the most important lessons that Native Americans have taught this entire country is that human beings, all of us, are part of nature. And we have to live with nature, coexist with nature, and if we destroy nature, we are ultimately destroying the human beings of this planet. And one of the areas that I am very concerned about is the issue of climate change. Climate change is real, it is caused by human activity, and it is already causing serious problems in our country and throughout the world. And that means that we have to transform our energy system away from fossil fuels to energy efficiency and sustainable energies. Okay, so let me conclude by saying, again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, B, uh, we will develop, if I'm elected president, a new relationship uh, with uh, the Native American people. C, what I understand the case to be, that poverty here, unemployment here, substance abuse here is much, much too high. And together, we are going to create the jobs and the health care and the educational opportunities the people here on Pine Ridge and throughout Indian country are entitled to. Thank you all very much. And what I want to do now is we are going to have some folks come up and speak for a few minutes about specific issues. Then we're going to open it up for your questions and your comments. All right, let's start uh, with uh, Tati Wee, who is uh, the Attorney General here.
Um, I'm going to stand to the side because I feel awkward standing in front of you. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Attorney General for the tribe, and so one of the biggest issues that we see in our communities is the high rate of recidivism, whether it's for our tribal inmate population, our tribal members that are stateside convictions, or our federal uh, inmates. Uh, 60, over 60% 60 of our federal uh, individuals that are on federal probation uh, are violated on that probation for status of offenses. It's over 60%, status offenses being intoxicated, high on some type of drug. We're in this revolving wheel, like mice in a, a hamster wheel here, where we're doing the same things, putting people in jail, and it's not effective. So we have to totally revamp the way we look at criminal justice and incorporate what we're doing to treat addiction medically and behaviorally. So I'm glad you mentioned the addiction because, because of our unique status with uh, the federal government, our treaties give us that trust and um, treaty responsibility to fe our federal partners, IHS being one of them. So at what point in time will Indian Health Service be held accountable for the type of health care they provide for our people? When are they going to get ahead of the curve and start implementing medicine and practices and technologies that are effective for handling addiction? Can I interrupt you? Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do, let me just, uh, if I might, to make this discussion maybe more vibrant. I want to, you stay up here, stay on, but I want to involve other people. All right, is, why are so many people getting in trouble with the law? Can I ask that question, Tati? All right, stand up, I'll raise your hand, raise your hand, I'll let, let's get. My question is, the Attorney General makes a good point, that you have a system that is failing, people get arrested, they go to jail, they come back, they go to jail again, right? All right, so let's start off, help me out here. Why are so many people going to jail in the first place? Raise your hand, people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, is marijuana a major, take the mic. Take the mic. Hold the mic close to your mouth. Yup. I think the federal government needs to decriminalize marijuana. Okay. All right. Are a lot of people getting in trouble with the law because of possession of marijuana? Is that an issue? No. All right, Ray, no. sir, stand up here, please. Paul, get the mic to him. I firmly believe that uh, on these reservations, since we are so remote, that like this lady back here yelled, she said, boredom. Our youth don't have much to do, let alone the adults, so they reach out for in this uh, extracurricular activities to relieve themselves with some sort of chemical or negative influence. Next thing you know, they end up in jail. And I think that's pretty much the basis, isn't it? Poverty is a big one. Okay. All right, you know what I'd like? And I'm gonna give you the, is this okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I just want to involve it. I'm giving you the mic. I want young, young people. Some young people. Right here. Okay, you guys, stand up. Tell me why people are getting arrested. Is it true that people are bored, nothing to do? What's going on? Young lady right here. Do you want to stand up? Yeah, you. There's a microphone right behind you. If you can hold it. Stand up. Hold it to your mouth. What's going on? Um, there's less activities. Like, I don't know. Just say, it's like everyone's into softball, boxing, and everything. And then everyone, and, and I'm kind of sick. Are you doing good? You're doing good. <laughs> Um, is there not just not enough activities yeah, for young no, people? No, no activities for like everyone. Okay. Like, yeah, not everyone, not into everything. Okay, good, good job. Hello. Um, well, like what Katie was saying, she said there is not really anything to do around here besides sports. But you know, not everyone's into sports. Some people are into skateboarding, the park, uh, oh, art, music, reading, but we don't really have a place to go, or those people don't really have a place to go. Like for me, I'm a basketball player, and this right here is my place to go. Uh, the readers, they don't have nowhere to go, or... Right, let me ask you another. I'm going to ask you a hard question. You ready for a hard question? Yes. Do kids here think that when they get out of school, they're going to have decent jobs? 
All right, who wants to talk about the young man with the interesting hairdo there, right? Okay. There's not enough jobs available for us because some kids are dropping out and not earning their high school diploma. But jobs out there, they require their diploma. But for us, it's hard because of where we grew up. People aren't depending on us more because of, um, how should I put this? Sometimes it's dependency. People think, oh, I don't have a job. I need to depend on someone else. No, dependency is when you need, to, when you need the job. They need it to depend on themselves to get themselves up in the world. Good. All right, thank you. All right, I want to get a sense here. I want to get a sense of how young people feel about the future. Are they happy with school? Are they looking optimistically to get jobs? And I'm hearing that that is not the case. Are many of the young people here thinking that, in fact, if they do well in school, they can go to college? Or is college just a distant dream, too expensive? Who wants to talk to me about that? I see a young lady over there. Yes. 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 Can we get a mic to that young lady? Stand up. Where's the mic? No, that's her, right. Thank hey. you. Um, <laughs> Hold that mic right close to your mouth. I guess our views on, like, college and stuff, it seems kind of far. Like, um, some of us, we get, like, we lose motivation. We lack motivation. Sometimes it could be related to home stuff. But, I mean, here, too, it's just, like, it seems far. It seems so far. Now, like, if I were to tell you, like, if I were to tell you point blank that if you did well in school, if you studied hard, I would guarantee that you would go to a public college or university. Would that make a difference in your life? Yeah, it would probably make me strive for the best that I could be, but sometimes there's no motivation, there's like no hope. Like you, a lot of us think about our future and we're just like, damn, I wonder if we're gonna even be there. Or I wonder if we'll make it there. Will we graduate? Will we get there? Are we gonna be able to afford college? Are we gonna get there and then are we gonna drop out? Are we gonna just like be one of those people that get a chance and then we just come back home? like? Because that's a lot of what happens. Are you seeing a lot of your friends turning to drugs or mm -hmm. to alcohol? Yep. Myself included. I'm be honest. <laughs> uh, do you want to say a word on that or not? Oh, uh, no. But okay, that's fine. Yeah, it happens. I mean, a lot of us turn to that. It's, it's the truth. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> no, that's right. Okay. Well, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Okay. Let's stay with the young people. Um, what are right, we have, let's get uh, other comments from young people. Anybody else? All right. Where am I seeing? All right. Thank you. Let's get a mic pulled. We get a mic to. Well, I think that the support, first of all, should come from within the homes. We as young people see our parents, our uncles, our aunties doing drugs and abusing things, so. All right, so let me stop you and interrupt you. Again, I'm trying to understand. What you're saying is in many households, parents are doing alcohol or drugs. Yeah, so we see it and we, um, growing up thinking that it's okay and that it's acceptable. So if parents are doing it, then the kids are gonna start doing alcohol or drugs. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. And I feel that if like, there's more support there, then we can start believing that, there, that we can go to school. And maybe if like, the college tuition's free, then it's another possibility because a lot of us can't afford school. Okay. And it's like another obstacle, like, oh my God, how am I gonna pay for this? All right, so if I told you that if you did well in school, I mean, you're gonna have to do well in school and be prepared, but if you did well in school, that public colleges and universities would be tuition free to you. Would that make a difference in your life? I think it would make a difference. It pushed me, myself, to do better and okay. to show others that we can, we can do it. All right, let me change. People can talk about anything they want to, but I want to stay maybe on education. And I want you to be honest with me. Are you getting the quality education you think you need? All right, I see a young lady right there. Yes. All right. I think education on the reservation isn't what it should be. The teachers, they're, you know how drugs and everything is a problem on the reservation? Some of our teachers are like that too and they just don't care about 
the education that we're getting. And they just think that they want to be cool with the, with the students and everything. And they're not teaching us what we need to be taught. And they're not motivated to teach either. So they're thinking if they don't want to teach us, then why would, why would we want to learn that? And okay, very good point. Okay, thank you very much. Other comments? All right, I see a, yep, a hand right here, Paul. Okay, yep. What we need here is support. Hold the mic close okay. to your mouth. What we need here is support from the federal government for our school systems to teach the way that we learn. I took my kids out of the public school and I homeschooled them because I didn't feel like the way they were being taught was meeting their needs. We need to restructure our education system across all Indian lands to the way that we learn. We need to bring teachers up to teach how we learn. We don't need to learn American standards. We need to learn our standards first. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, I see a gentleman in the blue over there. Yes, stand up if you could, sir. I personally think that um, a lot of the problems on the reservation stems from how nonviolent drug offenders are treated in the justice system. Um, there are, are a lot of people that go to prison for using drugs. I have been incarcerated for having dirty pee, and what they're doing, they're, um, they're having these kids go to these federal prisons for selling marijuana, and they're coming back with meth connections. And it's just, uh, the, the justice system isn't really meant for us. Okay, got it, thank you. All right, I want to stay on an issue. I think at the heart of a lot of things is the lack of jobs and the lack of income. Is that true? Yeah. All right, who wants to talk about that? Why is it? Yes, young man right here in blue. Yeah. Can we get a mic? I don't believe Hold there's that a, mic close. I don't believe there's a lack of jobs. I just think there's a lack of motivation around here because there are over 100 ranchers that look for help every day. They go around helping, looking for help, pull people out of their beds just to, just to get help. And they pay really well. And some people are afraid to stand up to them because they, because they don't know what to do when they go to work. And then there's no inspiration from the educated world to, uh, help us, motivate us to get All right, our so you're saying there are some jobs available, but people don't know, have the job training to know, or the confidence to do those jobs. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We got a woman right back there. Paul, right in front of you. If you can get that mic turned. Okay. What I would like to say actually kind of touches on all of the subjects. Yet, when we bring it to the tribe, myself, 
when I brought this back home and said, I have something that will help, I couldn't even get past the door. I developed a gun registration program that is second to none, absolutely fraud proof using the blockchain. It couldn't, I mean, I've given it, I've given it to Ms. Um, Ms. Means' office, no response. We have an ID system for the tribal IDs, again, making them the most secure ID on the planet. Again, no one will talk to us. Okay. If you become president, would you support the tribe having a cryptocurrency as well, our I would support getting technology and broadband of the highest quality onto the reservations of this country because I don't know how you do economic development if you don't have cell phone service and if you don't have high quality broadband. All right, what I want to do now is I want to bring up, um, uh, uh, let's see, we have, all right, uh, Tati, did you want to conclude your remarks? Okay, let me go to uh, Evie uh, Espinosa, who's going to talk about uh, health care. Evie, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Are you staying up here too? Yeah, I'll stay right Okay, so first I want to take this time to first acknowledge Unchi Marie. Today is her birthday, and I want to wish her a happy 96th birthday. <laughs> Second, I want to thank Senator Sanders and all of you for making the time to come here and be a part of this event today. Uh, Elder once told me the most generous thing we can give of ourselves is our time. And so I want to thank you, and I want to thank all of you that came for that. Specific to health care, I know uh, Senator Sanders, you have a stance that health care should be a right for all. Yes. To us, it's something more than that because not only should it be a right for all, but we have a legal document with this federal government that assures we are entitled to quality and safe health care. And that is not being provided right now. Currently at home in Rosebud, our hospital is in what's called a systems improvement agreement because they lack the ability currently to provide safe and quality care. Our emergency room was shut down in December. And since then, six of our relatives have died in the back of our tribal ambulances eight miles from the next nearest ER. That is unacceptable and it's criminal. It's destroying families. It's feeding the system. And in my opinion, it's a modern form of genocide today. That system that is set to, for us to be able to go there and be taken care of and be helped, it, it's not that. It's destroying the people that work for it. It's, it's forcing them to enforce policies that go against everything we believe in. It doesn't support and foster making us a, a stronger nation, a stronger people, a healthy people. It does the opposite. So these staff members that work in these agencies are forced to say, either I enforce this policy that I know goes against everything I believe in, or I, or I give up my job. And four years ago, I chose to give up my job because I could not support a system that I didn't believe in and I know was detrimental to my relatives. And so there has to be a complete overhaul of how healthcare is provided to all of us and all of our lives, not just in Rose, but everywhere, not just in the Great Plains, everywhere. And uh, two, respect has to be given. It's due to what our ancestors fought for and why we have these things available for us today. It's extremely disrespectful for the agency that is in existence because of these special arrangements that were made between our governments to do a thing so that they're are failing so the, miserably. The Indian Health Service is failing. The Indian Health Service is failing miserably. And it's the system, the system is not set up and is not compatible with providing innovative, state-of-the-art healthcare delivery that is available in this country today. There's absolutely no reason why the United States of America has the highest quality of healthcare and we get the lowest quality of healthcare provided in this nation. Absolutely unacceptable. We sit here and we talk about all these, all these negatives, all these negatives, they're all interconnected. Right. And, and the root cause of that is 150, 200 years ago, our way of life, our identity was taken from us. And it created this, what we have to live in and, and fight for today. 
All of that was taken for us. So how do we overcome that? We need your help. We need people like you to one, acknowledge that this is wrong. <laughs> Educate the world from our perspective of what our history is. Help us spread that word and help us educate. And, I, and it means a lot that you're here today, so you're getting that education. And I just, you have so much broader of a network and that's available to you that I ask that you take our voice are what's important to us back to these people to make it a reality, to fix what is going on. All right, your voice today, where's our revolution, people? We here? We broadcasting this? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, your voice will get out around the country today. Okay. And one of the, you know, and one of the issues, um, that I feel very strongly about. It's just what you said, Evie. Promises were made, treaties were signed, and they, those promises were not kept. Uh, if elected president, we will keep those promises. <laughs> all right, I want to, right, Evie has made a very forceful presentation. I wanted to open it up a little bit if people are interested on the issue of healthcare. What are your experiences with the healthcare system? Uh, I see a hand here, right in the middle. Um, Paul, get that gentleman. If you could stand up, sir. Yeah, right. Get him a mic. No, gentleman, right behind you. We'll get to you in a minute. Okay, healthcare. All right, well, um, healthcare. Yeah, IHS don't do such a great job. Uh, my sister had scoliosis for a while. She's been to the ER multiple times. And every single time, except recently, she's came back with just painkillers. So, uh, you know, okay. they, they slack it. All right, she has a serious problem, and she's not getting the yeah. attention that she, does, she needs. Yeah, recently, she, uh, she has gotten laser surgery, so she is recovering, and she's Good. getting better. But at the time, uh, IHS was not helping whatsoever. Okay. So, Senator, if I can just sure. touch on a little bit. So, what he's sharing is a real life thing that we experience. Uh, a relative will go in to seek help for a condition and they're treated with pain medication because that is the most cost effective way to treat that according to policy. But it doesn't address the, the So problem. what it does is then creates full blown addictions and then it overflows onto the family and the ability to, for that family to be healthy. This addiction caused by an uh, uh, entity that is supposed to be there to protect right, us. So you're and saying that painkillers here are being given out in too great a number? I am saying that yes. painkillers are being used to treat conditions that require other right. treatments that are readily available to everybody else in the United States. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. okay so Healthcare, so woman over there, woman in black. Yeah. Paul, right over there. Thank you, Bernie Sanders. I feel so, this is awesome talking to you. Hey, so, you know, what, what's going, what I hear going on here is, of course, across the Indian country, everywhere. The example of health care for me would be, personally, is your example is you're going to Rapid City. So you got Rapid City, you got um, Indian Health Service in Rapid City. And that hospital has not been, uh, that's the same hospital that my mother, she's gone, bless her soul, she stayed in there during the TB time, that, back in the 30, uh, back in the 40s, 50s, or whatever it was, I remember, uh, but they incarcerated her people there for TB at one time. That hospital has never, I don't think, is still the same back since the 50s. They've never improved the health care there at that hospital. We all are, uh, I mean, we, we go in there. I have personally went in there for something in my leg and came out with cough syrup. So they're not prescribed, they're not listening or whatever it is. There also is a person in the emergency room that can barely speak English. So we're, we're this is what's happening in our country. What, what happens in Indian country is it's called substandard. It's been there since the 50s and 60s when our people were standing up and saying we have substandard health, substandard education, substandard. That's what the government has given us with their promises is just substandard. They have never changed it. And so all of this is just the ill of the substandard care that the government 
forgave us. No, we had all of that in place before colonization. We had, we were well, we cared for our people. We had, we knew the trees, we knew the medicines, we knew that was all taken from us, right? And then replaced into this Western medicine stuff that we never got. We never got that. We couldn't speak our languages. We never got that. We, they took our languages. So they, there's major gaps in our generations that are hurting us. So we couldn't pass those secrets down to our kids to stop the, the, the suicide. And so that's where we're at. It's, you need to help raise our, from substandard thinking and, quality, and care in our country, in our Indian country, to raise our substandard and get rid of that word altogether somehow and raise that consciousness. Good, thank you. Okay. Uh, CJ, with CJ. All right. uh, I'd like CJ Clifford to come up and talk a little bit about some of the issues as he sees it. Chief. Charles Tuna, you know, <clears throat> It's a great honor to be amongst you guys and be able to sit and talk, and in particular, education. Some of that was covered immediately right away, and I want to thank Senator Sanders for opening it up on education. Education is a, a need that we have every day of our lives. <clears throat> you talk about inadequate funding of the Bureau of Indian Education, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Department of Interior, all the extensions that come that is supposed to deliver the dollar to us. Um, I don't, I have a different way of telling my story than Chairman Steele does. <clears throat> yeah, what Chairman Steele's is the fact about delivering beef to my people in the early days. Delivering sick beef to my people and not all the beef that was awarded to us. Well, today it stands in the world of education is the same way. Today, out of the dollar, we receive 43 cents, and the government keeps 57 cents. And I have a dollar light bill in my school systems. I can't afford to pay for that. Let alone, I still gotta pay for my education, my students, and I gotta pay my teachers. So here in the state of South Dakota, and here in Indian country, the average wage is, far below. We're one of the lowest paid states in the United States of America. One of the things that has beaten us is the so-called consultation that the government puts forward in Indian country. They come here and they say, we're going to consult with this item. And this item is what we brought to you. It's not what I want to talk about. It's what you're going to tell me what we're, you're going to do and this is what we're going to do. Well, today we found a way to battle that. And today, right now, <clears throat> we've taken the government to task in Indian education. But bringing it out with your negotiated rulemaking processes that go on through, and it comes from the senator's office, we need to put together a negotiated rulemaking and we'll come up with some ideas. But still, even at the negotiated rulemaking level, it is still top heavy with the bureaucrats weighing in more than it allows my people to have say so, or my children. So, but if you can keep it open, just like you did, that is so beautiful to be able to ask them and lean out and ask, not just of the panel, there's well, so many questions. CJ, what I believe in, look, at the end of the day, people know the problems in their own community more than Washington will know the problems. People need the resources but your point is it cannot be the government telling the tribes what to do. There has to be common ground and working together. And I agree. Yes. And, um, you know, when we talk about the 43 and the 57, you as a senator appropriate X amount of dollars. But the people that work underneath you seem to take the majority of that right. money. Before money is not getting it. to the people. It's going to right. the bureaucracy. And before we get on too far, you know, you talked about the treaties. And not, one of the things in our life here is that we would, as Native people, like to see them treaties honored. Our Black Hills up there that you hear about and you're learning about, they're not for sale. And we want the world to know that. Good. Good. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, let's hear from Mel Lonehill. Mel.
Testing one, two. Kokahea la koliwa ekthelo. La kota tuna ya hippi kilina ya itimba hel. Uyako re itimba hel. Toske nao se punhe cha iwograk musipelo. The thing I said was, you know, that's my language, my first language, and that's my tradition, culture. And the influence. Let me ask you a question. Is that language being kept alive? Is it being yes. taught to the children? Yes. It is. Some say no, some say yes, but we're trying hard okay. to put those back into our education system. Okay. Okay, the, the thing is the infrastructure. The infrastructure nationally and locally has deteriorated. Yes. You know, it's gone to the dogs. We don't have no infrastructure here due to lack of education, management, you know, all these things that come in this circle of Lakota, it's not there. Or it's there, but you know, it's hard to get anything because you know, of the education. And then the first major problem that we, ha that we have here is our health care. You know, I am a vet, you know, and I know there's a lot of vets out there that suffer the health care. I mean, we have the VA right here. In the Does the VA of, do a decent job? The VA hasn't done a darn thing, in my words, in my opinion. Okay. And then here locally. Evie, is that your judgment as well, that the VA is not doing what it should be doing? or? Our tribal members struggle very much with both systems. And to an extent, they're, they're discriminated against because they're... The IHS says we're a pair of last resort, go to the VA, then the VA says the same okay, thing, and then these vets who have fought for this country don't get the care that they need. Okay, Mel, so could you continue? I didn't, need to, I didn't mean to interrupt you, sir. Yeah, okay, now you go to the VA today, all the hospitals, I think there's three floors in a VA hospital. There's three floors of secretary, secretary, secretary. You know, and here you go here, it's the same thing. You know, the administration is top heavy, and the patients are, aren't cared, cared for. You know, we get sick, we're flown to, flown to Rapid City, Sioux Falls, Scotts Bluff, and we're stuck over there. Let me ask you a question, if I might. Anybody wants to answer it. Does the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs come here to talk to you? No. No. The top, the top area in the Aberdeen area, that the money stays up there. Maybe 30% or 40% comes here for the infrastructure. So the, the bureaucracy eats up a lot of the yeah. money. Okay. So we're, we have the biggest, the made, big major problem here on all the reservations, not locally here, but all Indian country. You know, we only get 40 cents out of a dollar to operate the infrastructure that we have here. Okay. Well, Mel, thank you very much. Um, Senator Sanders, if I may add? Yes. Over here. Um, <clears throat> exactly one, one year ago today, the District of Columbia, D.C., Washington, D.C., enacted an educational law that says that all schools will teach Native American history in D.C., <clears throat> but they only enforced it within the D.C. area. I would like to see that particular law be mandatory for all states to Good. teach Native American history. Good. All right, I think what C.J. and others have talked about is the need to maintain and revive Native American culture. Is that an important issue? All right, and, and that means making sure the young children know the language and the culture and the history of their people, is that right? And we're not doing that to the degree we should be doing it now? And non-Indians understanding that, mm -hmm. that that needs it. And, okay. uh, right, but you have so many other things. I look, look in the crowd and, and every talk about the, 
the um, health care system. I, I know a young lady I would like to call on and, and ask her if she would say a word or two about the health care system. Who was that? Miss May Rodriguez. May, May Rodriguez? <laughs> May, May is a survivor of cancer, and I, okay. I would like to have everybody give her a round of applause. Uh, well, hello, Mr. Sanders, and welcome to the reservation. Um, yes, I, I, I'm on Medicaid, and I'm a survivor of breast cancer, ductile breast cancer. And um, I just thank God today, by the grace of God, I'm still standing here before you and before my people. And um, the, the way I've gone out and um, had to do this with getting treatment for um, breast cancer was having to leave the reservation and you were unable Medicaid. to you were unable to get the care that you needed here right, in right. this area. Yes. Okay. So I left the reservation. I've gone to St. Louis. I've gone to Utah and where Utah is where I and and what our people need to understand when you're on Medicaid, you can go outside of here. You can leave. But the thing is when I left, I had to, you know, uh let them know that I was staying with somebody in a different state in order to have that Medicaid transfer there. So I've done that. And then when I went to Utah to try to, um, for the uh, treatment there, which I, which I received, and um, that's where I got the surgery, and right, it but, was successful. All right, but the bottom line, what I'm hearing you tell me is you could not get the treatment that you needed for breast cancer in this area. Right, okay. right. Okay, well, that's right, not sir. acceptable. And, that is not acceptable. And may I please mention another thing um, before I close here. Um, when you become president of the United States, We got a lot of hurting parents here. There's a lot of injustice that is done to our people, Mr. Sanders. My son was one of them, and he was murdered in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'm bringing this out because I was told that our that there's no, our, that it was out of our jurisdiction here to receive justice for my son. And I was told over and over again by Greg Peterman that it was out of their jurisdiction. But since when are our children out of jurisdiction? Thank you. Let me um, just say this. First of all, I want to thank all of um, the tribal leaders who have spoken. What I have heard loudly and clearly is there is a lot of pain in this community. There are a lot of people who are turning to drugs to escape the reality of their lives. There are a lot of children who may be giving up, and I want to say something to the kids, if I might. I know that there are temptations out there in drugs and alcohol and everything else. That is not going to solve the problem. All right? And what we have got to do under difficult circumstances, and I appreciate that the circumstances are difficult, you got to fight back, you got to get your lives in order, and you got to fight your way through this stuff. Because if you succumb to drugs and alcohol, there is not going to be much of a future. Is that right? All right. So please, I know it is hard. And if I'm elected, you're going to have the resources that you need to get the education that will benefit your lives. 
We're going to do the best we can to bring jobs into this community so people don't have to turn to crime in order to earn a living. We are going to significantly improve the health care system because I think the point that Evie made is absolutely right. Treaties were negotiated and quality health care is part of that treaty. All right, And that's what we're going to do. And I think, by the way, that's true not just for Indian country, it is true for every person in the United States of America. All right, we got a lot of work. We've got a lot of work to do. But the history of everything is that nothing ever good happens if people give up. If we give up, nothing good happens. I want every kid here to be studying hard with the hope and expectation you will get a good education and a good job. But you have got to continue the fight to make that happen. Nothing happens if people just complain. We've got to stand up, be involved in the political process. All right, here's a promise, all right? If elected president, the head of the Indian Affairs Bureau will be here on this reservation. How's that? All right, I just want to thank again all of you uh, for being here uh, today, and I hope uh, to see you again in the not too distant future. Thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.